Welcome back to Theodisc, the WTC Theology Podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Innes, and I'm delighted that you've joined me for this episode when I'll be in conversation with Matt Lynch. Matt is Associate Professor of Old Testament at Regent College in Vancouver, Canada. But before that, he was Dean of Studies here at WTC and is still spoken of with much affection and respect around the college. He is the author of First Isaiah and the Disappearance of the Gods, Portraying Violence in the Hebrew Bible, and the book we will be discussing today, Flood and Fury. Matt is also the co-founder of one of our favourite podcasts, OnScript, which focuses on providing engaging conversations on the Bible and theology. I hope this episode will help bring some clarity to some of the difficult questions raised when we read the Old Testament, particularly in light of the God we see revealed in Jesus Christ. If you enjoy Theodisc, then please share it with your friends and leave us a review on the platform where you get your podcasts. You can also email us any questions or comments at podcast at wtctheology.org.uk. Now, on to my conversation with Matt Lynch. Enjoy. We're delighted to have Dr. Matthew Lynch on the podcast. Matt, great to have you with us. Thanks, Kenny. Um, it's you know, so good to talk to someone from WTC and you specifically. Um, I love WTC, so it's great to reconnect in this way. We're going to have a discussion today around your new book, Flood and Fury. Right. But before we get into that, um, you have to run the gauntlet of the three questions I ask all of our first-time guests. Excellent. We want to know a little bit about you. And these questions revolve around things that you return to, things that are kind of constants in your life. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we are interested in what's new, but we also want to know about what's old for you. What's the thing that you keep coming back to? So <laughs> the three categories are uh, a book. You can't yeah. use the Bible. Mm. Um, okay. You can't get around that by saying the Hebrew Bible either. Yeah, or the Septuagint. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a book, um, food or a meal, um, and a place that you return to. So let's go with a, a book first. Okay. Uh, so book would probably be The Chosen by Kaim Potak. And he's a Jewish author who wrote a number of wonderful novels. And The Chosen is just, especially for people in... Um, either in academia or who are learning um, within a religious context, it's very, it, it's so, it feels so relevant and um, such a fascinating window into uh, also kind of window into Judaism in New York in the uh, 1940s, really. So fascinating book. He's definitely one of my favorite authors too. I have my name as Asher Lev on the bookshelf, yeah. which I haven't, I've not gotten to it oh. yet, but um Oh, you have to read it. That I mean, that's right up there too. <laughs> okay, on your recommendation, I'll read yeah. it this summer. Yeah, yeah, I would start earlier. I would start maybe after the podcast. <laughs> maybe during. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you know, if I'm going on and on, just pick up the book. <laughs> um, what about a food or a meal? Food. Um, so I think about food. Not. I'm trying to interpret this literally. Like, not my favorite meal but a food I return to more in a ritualistic sense. So that would be just bread and olive oil. Um, so, and salt on the olive oil. But I just, I could eat that three meals a day and probably not get tired of it. So that's, that's my go-to. Now you've lived in Britain, so you remember Tesco. Yeah. Does a wonderful olive bread. The, oh, in the olive oh, oil. olive oh, bread, yeah. I, I'm trying to remember if I ever had I probably had it at some point. I like olive bread. Okay, and a place that you return to? Uh, so here in Vancouver, we often go to Pacific Spirit Park, which is it's um, on the peninsula where University of British Columbia is and Regent is, um, but it, there's this huge, like they call it the endowment lands, and big forested area with giant Douglas fir trees. And sometimes like even if it's raining, it's so gorgeous there because all the moss in the forest just lights up. It's almost like the lights mm. turn on with the rain. Wow. So, um, yeah, I love going there. Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you. 
So now we know you, we can get into talking about what's new. And you have this book, Flood and Fury. So what led you into the writing of that? Um, well, let's. There, there are many streams that flow into the the creation of this book. Um, so if I could highlight a few, it's. I mean, WTC played a role in that in the sense that once I started, I'll, go, I'll work backwards and forwards. But once I started teaching there, the question of violence in the Bible came up often among students, and it was one I had already uh, thought about and taught on a bit, but hadn't really written on. And and I remember writing some for the blog that WTC had or still has, um, Theological Miscellany. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote wrote some posts for that. Um, I was teaching, you know, in the book of Joshua. And I, I remember a student at, at WTC one time saying, you know, I feel like I run to Jesus from the God of the Old Testament. And and I felt like that was such an honest take on this this sense of like, not wanting to feel that way, but but also like feeling this disconnect between the God revealed in Jesus and who God is in the Old Testament, um, or at least perception of who God is. So um kind of came out of that. And then also having a few pacifist colleagues <laughs> kind of, you know, brings it comes up in conversation a lot too yeah. about what we do with violence in the Bible. Um, so it was part of the uh, faculty conversation, but also a student conversation. And then but before that, you know, I had I studied in grad school, uh, sort of in the wake of 9/11, and um, and, and also the the Iraq invasion in 2003. So th those events, those geopolitical events, were sort of playing in the background while I was studying the Bible, and specifically, I had a class in Joshua. So, you know, when it's like 2003, four, and you're studying Joshua, it's hard not to to make make the connections between what was happening in Iraq and what I was reading. And and so among us students, that was that was a, a very prevalent conversation. Um, and then I remember when I was doing my doctoral studies, I was asked one time to teach a I was substituting for an adult Sunday school class. And the teacher was like, oh, could you teach on genocide in Joshua? <laughs> and and I was like, OK. And my approach, and really my approach hasn't changed. I was like, well, I'm going to read through Joshua with that question in mind and just right. see what I notice. And so I went through slowly. And and what became apparent in the process was that this book is doing way more with the subject of violence and insiders and outsiders and, and all these questions that impinge on the question of genocide um, than meets the eye. So there's there's a need for at least a nuanced approach to this book, even though I don't have some magic key that unlocks the problem. As I was reading your book, I was thinking about Brent Strawn's provocative title of his book, The Old yeah. Testament is Dead. This idea of the Old yeah. Testament is kind of like a line dying at least. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> 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 it's not dead yet <laughs> not dead yet old testament is dying thanks brent yeah. <laughs> but this idea that um the old testament is kind of like a language that we've lost touch with mm -hmm. of how to fully understand um and i've spoken to people who've said that they just can't read the old testament is too problematic for them um so how do you think that our discomfort around the passages of violence has kind of contributed to our maybe our growing inability to really connect and read the Old Testament. Yeah, I think maybe I'd think about it the other way around in the sense that a byproduct of the loss of the Old Testament is a lack of nuance and sophistication when coming to a very difficult question like that. So in, in a way, like you can get by. So if your facility with the Old Testament is very weak and you just sort of, you know, maybe check in with it every once a year, that's Psalm 23. Um, uh, then, then, then you can get by with maybe some simple questions about, like, um, you know, whether whether God is Creator according to the Bible or something like that. You know, it's just the, those introductory questions. But when it comes to like dealing with a very complex and challenging ethical issue, if you're if if you're in a kind of church environment, and you personally. Um, have have lost facility with the full range of the Old Testament and an ability to speak it fluently, to use Brent's language, um, not just in the sense of knowing dates, places, and content, but actually 
knowing how the Old Testament works uh, historically and its genres and so on. Um, then, then you're you're left with like at maximum sim- very simple and simplistic approaches to the problem of violence. So, so I, w- I would see it that way that like our loss of the Old Testament then in the wake of that when this question comes up inside or outside the church, simplistic answers abound. So you either get like the, you know, God's a monster or the response to that, which is, oh no, he's, he's very loving. Look at this verse over here. Right. (laughs) So, um, or if you took sin seriously enough, you'd realize that we all deserve to die. And so it's not really a problem. Right. So both of those are very simplistic answers on either end of the spectrum. Yep. I often think as well about the way that we, make heroes of the the figures yeah. that we find in the old testament and to kind yeah. of uh read more closely and slowly as you suggest feels that we're kind of undercutting that yeah yeah very much so um yeah you can i think people don't like to lose their heroes whether it be david or mm-hmm. nehemiah or um even joshua so i i think um that that's that that comes out of a particular model of how to read the Bible, which is these are examples, like little life lessons throughout the Old Testament given to us in in kind of like isolated as isolated islands mm-hmm. that can be taught and directly applied. So I th- I think yeah, all those are are factors for sure. So in the book, you do you urge us to be wary of these approaches that you've mentioned mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that um, make it easy to resolve mm. some of the difficulties and mm. um, actually there's a there's a point where you really argue against seeing it as a problem that needs to be mm-hmm. solved maybe some of the yeah. approaches are taking that angle where we need to solve this and get this fixed yeah. what kind of approach would you suggest yeah so I, I i outline a number of approaches that have elements of merit to them that at least in my estimation um but I think ultimately falls short in part because they offer a totalizing solution to the problem. Um, and so with violence, there's um, there are so many different factors impinging on this, this issue that that's not to say that we can't know anything about how to move forward. Um, but I think recognizing it as a wicked problem, not in a moral sense, but as a very tangled up problem um, means that we respond to it accordingly. And and there's this great study that says like me- wicked problems require messy solutions. And messy doesn't necessarily mean that you're just going all over the place, right. but, it, but it means that you, you have to approach it in a multi-pronged uh, and, and sometimes like field adaptive way. And that's what I try to do in the book and try to model that where I come at the you know the flood story, the book of Joshua, from different angles throughout throughout the book. Because, well, if you, if you look at it this way, you see this. If you look at it this way, you see this. Um, and I think that's actually a more responsible way forward with this kind of issue. Well, let's maybe move into a couple of examples then, and mm-hmm. really the focus of your book, the two main narratives that you're pulling from are are Genesis 1 to 11 Mm -hmm. and the conquest presented in Joshua. So let's look at Genesis 1 to 11 first. Um, You kind of try to sharpen our focus between shalom and violence as presented Mm -hmm. in that narrative. And I found that to be quite interesting. There seemed to be a reframing of our attention on the real issue that God, the real dilemma that God is facing here. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I begin with creation uh, because, well, first of all, the Bible starts there. So it's a good place to start. Um, but also the, the way the creation story is told is against the backdrop of cultural stories that were being told in the ancient world, wherein uh, creation is brought about through violent acts. And so if you think about like the the classic and and most prevalent in the ancient world, which is the Babylonian Enuma Elish Mm. uh, creation account, in that account, the world is made through the violent subjugation of 
an enemy deity mm-hmm. um, who's represented in the in the water. And so you have like the 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 watery opponent who is slain and car- carcass is is ripped in half and and out of her is made the heavens and the earth. And then the blood of a of another deity is mixed with the ground to create humanity. So you have the world and humanity made out of violent conflict. And in Genesis seems to be engaging that story, but saying these these waters in the beginning are not hostile to humanity or to God in particular. God doesn't have to overcome them. Uh, he he speaks to into this creation and and the world is formed. So the waters in that story are just not yet. They're unformed and unfilled. Um, so so that's how creation comes about in Genesis 1. And, and so as William Brown put it, the world is delightfully non-hostile to God. And, and then humanity is given this task of ruling and subduing, which in some contexts could connote violent subjug- subjugation again. But there's, there's, um, they're given that command within a world where they're image bearers and they're imaging a God who loves creation. And wants it to flourish and multiply and grow and develop, so, so that rule and subdue takes on a different balance within that within that context. And they're of course given a vegetarian diet, so you know they're not going off killing animals as an expression of their ruling and subduing. Right. So, um, so all that to say that in Genesis one, violence is not woven into the DNA of creation. It's not part of the basic structure of the world. It's not necessary. And if it's not necessary, that means that that whatever violence follows in the story as the biblical story unfolds is an aberration. Um, it's a deviation from what God ultimately wanted in the beginning and where God is moving things redemptively in the end. So the biblical story, at least we can say it's framed by Shalom. And, and that helps us kind of orient to the stuff in the middle now we still have questions about that, but at least sets the terms for the discussion. Just like with male female in the biblical story, whatever happens in the middle um, is not necessarily an expression of how things should be, right. because in the beginning it was male female co ruling in creation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's and actually it's right there in the text when you get to the the flood narrative that God's yeah. grief is actually oh, yeah. upon yeah. seeing violence being perpetrated. Yeah. Yeah, so there there I talk about um another known cultural story which is the flood story. They they were floating around the ancient world so to speak and and Israel is engaging these known flood myths, these primordial stories of origin um that were being circulated culturally and and recasting them in a Yahweh framework. Um, so it's like the it's like taking a popular story and then recasting it in Christian terms or something like that. So what the biblical writers do, which is pretty ingenious, I think, is they they have to figure out how to tell the create the flood story with within a monotheistic mm-hmm. uh, outlook. And so you can't have one protagonist God telling Noah to build the ark and put all the animals in it, and then a an antagonist God sending the flood. Um, and and I think most people would would sort of fly over the story and say, well, God does both of those things, and that's only partially true because in the way the story unfolds, the antagonist in the story is violence, because it says in the lead up to the flood that the earth filled um, with violence. And then in response, God looks at it and behold, it was ruined. Hmm. And that declaration on God's part is a direct inversion of the statement from Genesis 1.31, where God looks at the earth and behold, it was very good. So this very good creation has been turned on its head and inverted and ruined by the antagonist in the story, which is violence. And so God's work then, subsequent to that declaration and recognition is to return creation back to its watery formlessness in order to remake it so he's he's but that act of flooding and formlessness is in response to an already ruined creation so that doesn't resolve everything but it does i think 
change the terms of the story away from a God who just simplistically comes, is angry because people are bad, and floods it uh, and and ruins creation. So in that whole section, in this this introduction to the biblical story, there's a lens that's already provided there, which gives us a critique yeah. of what happens and violence is perpetrated by humans. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I think it's pretty important that in this Genesis 1 to 11 section, which, um, as your listeners will probably know, is, is a really critical part of the biblical story. I mean, this is, it's called by some scholars, the, um, the primeval history, um, and the, it has all these kind of, uh, stories of origin in that section. And it's giving us a kind of perspective on the world within which God is going to then work through the family and story of Abraham in Genesis 12 onward. But this backdrop in Genesis 1 to 11 is not just kind of FYI stuff. Like if you're interested in, in like, you know, ancient history, um, th these stories are told to tell you something about the nature of the world as it is, mm. as we experience it now. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely a lens. And within that, then violence plays a lead role. You know, all the way back in Genesis 3, we're told that there's going to be this conflict between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman, and it's going to involve uh, violence. Uh, so striking at the heel and the woman striking at the serpent. Um, so so that's uh, those are violent terms. And then right in the next chapter, Cain and Abel, the first, you know, outside the garden story depicting what's wrong with humanity is a, is a story of uh, fratricide. Um, and then, of course, leading up to the flood, it's violence that fills the earth. So that's, this is not a minor subplot, according to the Bible. It's a big deal. And I think it's important, at least wherever we go with this question of violence, to recognize that the Bible sees it as a really big problem. Yeah. And so then as we read through the narrative, as we continue, and we see these occasions of violence occurring again and again, we mm -hmm. have Genesis 1 to 11 in our minds. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the passages that makes people fret the most is Joshua and the yeah. language of conquest and war. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that, particularly about the term harem is that, you know, this yeah. term that has received a lot of scrutiny um, yeah. because it has this connotation of total destruction. So yeah. we have this sense that God is commanding Israel to totally destroy the Canaanites, mm -hmm. men, women, children, animals. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a bit shady, isn't it? Sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is a bit shady. Um, yeah, so the that term harem in Hebrew, not not like a a bunch of women that a king has, um, but <laughs> it's 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 that guttural harem. Um, right. That's the the show them no mercy, wipe them out totally um, term. It comes out of the book of Deuteronomy. And, and that's really where it's not the first occurrence of it in the Bible, but it's where it's, it becomes a term to talk about the, um, a law or a command that God is giving Israel regarding the Canaanites. Um, so I think it's important to, first of all, recognize its place in Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy is, uh, in some respects, like Moses being a fiery preacher. And, and so it is. A piece of rhetoric, um, or if you if you if you think of it as like a polemical piece, uh, where you would expect in a highly polemical piece, exaggeration, um, over the top language, vivid colors, stark black and white terminology, um, and it's not unlike entirely the kinds of stark fiery things we hear from Jesus when he says that, you know, um, for those who cause these children to stumble, it would be better if a millstone was tied around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Right. Um, you know, he's not getting into all the complexities. Uh, he's, it, it's, that's a, a zero sum game right there. Once that millstone's around your neck, or when he says, you can't be my disciple unless you hate your father, mother, brother, and sister and follow me. Mm. And he doesn't qualify it. He doesn't say, now, now, hold on, I'm not speaking literally. I just want you to be committed to me. <laughs> he wants, he because, so if he nuance it, 
the force of it doesn't hit you. Right. And and if your eye causes you to sin, your hand, your foot, gouge gouge it out, cut them off. Um, so we have to let it hit us hard. So I don't want to domesticate that language too quickly because it's in Deuteronomy, it's against the backdrop of if you follow these Canaanites, they will lead you into idolatry. And with with Yahweh, there's no um there's no middle ground. You're either totally loyal to and allegiant to Yahweh, to use Matt Bates' term mm-hmm. that you just um, interviewed, mm-hmm. um, or you're you're going to fall into the Canaanite trap. Um, so total loyalty to Yahweh is what Deuteronomy calls for, and it uses that punchy rhetoric to say it. Now, now here's the caveat or the footnote, and that is it is hyperbole or exaggeration. It is over the top language. Not only when the command is given, but I also think in the stories where it's depicted as having been enacted. And we know that because in Deutero- in Joshua, then, when this is enacted against the Canaan- certain Canaanite groups, I should say, um, we find out in later chapters that in those places, there were all kinds of Canaanites still running around in many instances. Right. Um, there are exceptions to that, like Jericho and I. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's it's clear that Joshua makes it clear that this is exaggeration rhetoric. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that looking at how later biblical texts l- interpret that law from Deuteronomy chapter seven is important too, because they when they um, like King Josiah, he's depicted as like the the most Torah keeping king to come along. In fact, he finds a copy of the Torah in the temple, uh, or his uh, officials do. And uh, and in response to that, he reads it, reads the book of the law, which is a shorthand way of saying probably Deuteronomy. Right. And what does he do? He goes throughout the land and he chaps down all the altars, the idols, the pillars, all that stuff, all the Canaanite paraphernalia. Um. And, and so that means that like what he's doing is reading this Deuteronomic law, but he's not hunting down Canaanites, even though he could have. Right. Um, instead, he he gets to the heart of it, which is destroying idolatry. And that that tells us, and there are other examples of that, that when when biblical writers are looking back on that law, they're not applying it literally. They're applying it in reference to avoiding idolatry and the kinds of intermarriage that would lead to idolatry. Because that's the core issue. So while there are still instances where there is violence by the sword, and that's just yeah. inescapable, uh, I like that sense of um, yeah, of getting to the heart of what Moses is really commanding. Yeah. And I think, yeah. you know, it's possible, isn't it, for us to say that if a, if a nation has its gods wiped out, that that nation mm-hmm. is in essence um, yeah. humiliated and brought low. Yeah, that's, wiped a, that's out. a good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other interesting thing that I think Joshua is doing, um, and, and this is something I didn't see so much in, in other commentaries, is that Joshua is taking this command against idols, but applying it specifically to the manifestations of imperial power that show up in the land of Canaan. Mm-hmm. So, there's one kind of idolatry, which is bowing down to an actual image. And there's another kind of idolatry, which is the adoration of and um, essentially the worship of power. And and I think Joshua is is very much focused on on the latter form of idolatry. Uh, so in the conquest, a, a lot the the primary battles are against these walled cities which we know historically were essentially outposts of the uh, Egyptian empire. Right. So Egypt at this at the time Israel is going into the land of Canaan controlled most of the land of Canaan through these proxy kings who were um, given weapons and supplies and all that kind of stuff and funding in order to be uh, a buffer for the Egyptian empire between them and their bigger enemies to the north. So, uh, Joshua goes through with the people and 
and most of the battles, well, all the battles are against these walled cities, not the outlying villages and the you know poor folk living in tents and whatnot. Mm -hmm. They they attack these these walled cities specifically, and and also they destroy weapons of war like um, some of the super like the weapons of mass destruction in the ancient world would have been horses and chariots and and all of those. So that's that's what they they attack, and I think in that way they really they model a, a, a different kind of kingdom as well. Cause they, you know, at this time they had no King and they're, they're going after weapons, uh, these warlord Kings and these walled cities to keep it all W. In the book, I really encourage people to read it cause you, you do walk through various different nuances that enable us to see what's really going on. But another thing that you're keen to do is to continually draw it back to Jesus mm -hmm. and his character. Um, I've often heard people, when they talk about problematic passages of Vance in the Old Testament, they say they will read it with a Christocentric lens, which if you yeah. interpret that really means to them, if it doesn't line up with the character of Jesus, we can just kind of yeah. dismiss it or explain it away. Yeah. But I yeah. loved your observation where you said that um, Jesus shows us the kind of person that's possible to become through yeah. a deep immersion in an understanding of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that must mean there's hope for us as his yeah. disciples. Yeah, I that was that's really important to me that you know we recognize historically the person of Jesus was someone who grew up in a scripture immersed environment. And we see it and we hear it in his teachings that he knew scripture inside and out um, from an early age in the temple um, to his teaching as an adult, Jesus curriculum growing up. Cause we know he, he's, he wasn't known to be a student of any particular rabbi. His, his rabbi was, was the Torah was the, the Hebrew Bible. And, and I do, I do find hope in that because it means that, there is a way in which deep immersion in the scripture and being guided by the spirit in that endeavor lead, can lead to the kind of life and teachings that we see in Jesus. And so even though I might not in every particular instance be able to point to this text and show you exactly how it leads to Jesus, mm. like that's that's a maybe a too tall of an order. <laughs> um, but I can but I can pan out and say the whole taken as a whole, and, and through continual meditation on this day and night, as Joshua itself commends, um, that, that that is a process by which the Spirit can work in us to move us to become more like Christ. So even though we might have our questions and problems along the way, I think looking at Jesus' example does provide that, that kind of hope that you're, you're speaking of. And it's vital for us, as we've spoken, to reclaim the Old Testament and to value it, yeah. because if we worship Jesus, he's the culmination of that narrative of that Old Testament story and not a conf in conflict with it. Yeah. Yeah. He's not the sort of, it, it, Jesus is the mystery revealed. So there is a surprise element to Jesus, but the surprise isn't that it turns out God's actually nice. Um, that's not where the New Testament writers go. Um, it, it's, it's the particulars of Jesus' stories and his suffering, death, and resurrection that's the mystery revealed, um, and the you know the emergence of the church in the wake of that. But but there's a there's a character continuity that's affirmed by the New Testament in the person of Jesus. So so the the culmination of the story is not a subversion of the character of God as revealed in the Old Testament. Yep. Well, we're just we're at the end of our time told you it was going to be brief um <laughs> but if there's just one one final thing you could say to people to encourage people to um either engage in a different way or re-engage with the hebrew scriptures particularly around these texts what would you what would you say to folks i would say to and this is something i talk about toward the end of the book um to try to remember to keep central what the bible itself keeps central when when coming to the question of god's character um, I think there's a way of engaging the question of violence in the Bible that can lead us to Jesus and is hopeful. Um, but at the same time, there's a way of engaging that question where you so beat your head against this question and, um, that that actually skews your your view of who God is. 
And so I think as an exercise, you have to constantly pan out to look at look at how the Bible is summarizing the character of God um, revealed in Christ, but also within the Old Testament itself when it talks about, um, you know, at the end of the day, how did Israel sing about who Yahweh was in the Psalms? Um, the Lord, it, it draws from Psalm from Exodus 34, the Lord, the Lord, a God gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, and so on. So that that kind of reminding ourselves of the core can help us then with dealing with more peripheral matters like violence in the Bible that are not minor. I don't mean it's an unimportant question, but in terms of Christian core Christian convictions about the character of God or core doctrinal issues, it doesn't sit at the center. And it's important to say that and and remember that um, so that we don't make central unwittingly something that the Bible itself doesn't want us to. Great. Well, Matt, thank you um, for being on the podcast. I really enjoyed the book, found it valuable. I recommend all of our listeners pick up a copy of Flood and Fury. Thank you for helping us kind of reframe some of those issues. And I hope that those who are listening have really um, found that a valuable exercise. Appreciate you being on the podcast with us. Sure thing, Kane. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Matt, for your excellent book, Flood and Fury, and for giving us a renewed impetus to seek out the depths of meaning in the Old Testament especially within the difficult passages. In our next Theodisc episode, Kenny will be chatting with Jack Johnson, who teaches theology in praxis at WTC and is a PhD candidate at St. Andrews University. Yes, Kenny, we know it's in Scotland. Jack will be giving us some valuable insights into prayer and its many facets. When we pray, how do we understand the tension between God's sovereignty and our agency? Jack will share his thoughts. Theodisc is part of WTC, a theological college that seeks to partner with the Church through equipping and sending the whole people of God. Our innovative hub model allows you to study on any of our part-time programs without leaving your work or ministry. Come and find out more at wtctheology.org.uk. Thank you for listening to episode 18 of Theodisc. Join us for episode 19 with Jack Johnson as we explore what it means to pray. Bye for now. Bye.